Good morning. Again. I was just over there. Now I'm over here. So, same guy. But I'll put these on. Worked for Superman. So, all it took, I was like, this guy can't be Superman. He's got glasses. Anyway, I'm not Superman. Um, so, today, today we're doing something. I'm doing something different than actually than I've ever done in a couple of ways. One, I'm trying to get through the majority of two chapters of Romans in one sermon. We're going to try to finish the book of Romans today. We've been in it for a long time. And the thing about these, this last section is there's kind of a little something here and a little something there, some things for, for, for us to understand within the Lord, but they don't always all necessarily flow exactly. They're kind of like, there's this thing and there's that thing. And so what I'm doing is we're just going to go through it. There's no other stuff. It's just whatever this is, 50 verses of Romans straight through. And I want you to keep in mind as we're going through it, what's going on here again Back to the, to the first time that we dealt with this. Sorry, I'm cleaning my glasses. They're going to be needed today or I can't see. When we first got into it, we talked about the Jews and the Gentiles and, and this church in Rome and the, and the Jews, the Jewish Christians from Pentecost, they come, they start this church. Then the emperor kicks all the Jewish people out and then the Gentiles are the ones left and the church kind of starts to look pretty Gentile and then the Jews come back and it's like, who, you know, what are we doing? And, you know, think about like the worship wars that we have. You go to some churches and it's like, no instruments or just an organ. And then other churches are like, we want to play all the instruments. And they're like, that's not the way to do it. And a, it was way worse than that. Okay. It was way worse than just that kind of stuff. They were struggling about theological issues. Like, wait, do these Gentiles, Gentiles being anyone who wasn't a Jew, just for those of you who don't, um, who weren't here earlier in the study, do these Gentiles have to do all the stuff that we have to do? They have to follow the dietary laws. Do they have to become Jewish? They have to do the little snip, snip thing. Ask your mom at home if you don't know what that is. <clears throat> um, do they have to do all that? And of course, that's, you know, Paul's going through this and he's explaining and he's telling them, hey, look, Jesus saved Jew and Gentile, right? The gospel is for the Jew first, then for the Greek, for everybody. Everybody who believes is going to be saved. And so you have that context going on that we've just finished. You know, we went through all this theology, just deep, just mm, good, just like honey in your mouth, good theology, all the way through chapter 11. And then in chapter 12 and chapter 13 and chapter 14, we had all this very practical stuff about how to be the church, how to be an individual in Christ, how to submit yourself and become a living sacrifice, how to let your mind be renewed, all of these kinds of things that kind of 12 sets forth. And then we go through last week, we talked about legalism and licentiousness and how should we act when we disagree about um, something that isn't clear from the scripture. And we kind of walk through that. And now in chapter... Uh, 15, starting at verse 4, because we got through verse 3 last week. Through the end of 16, we got all kinds of stuff going on. And so what I want to do is just kind of take them one piece at a time and just walk through the scripture, keeping in mind what Romans is about as the Holy Spirit, right, inspiring Paul, closes out this book. So I'm going to grab a drink of water because we got a lot of verses to get through. I can't promise you we're going to make it through. I'm going to really try, though. I had enough coffee to talk fast. I thought, so, so keep up. And if you don't, if you can't get it all, go back when it's online and listen to it at like half speed. Oh, did I just lose this? Oh, there we go. All right. Try not to sound too much like Ben Shapiro. And you're like, whoa, you just said a lot. Okay, here we go. Actually, let's pray. Father, I pray you'd open the word to us. Open the word to us, Lord. Let us learn what you'd have us learn here in some of these sections that some people, I think, I don't think they throw them away, but they don't think that there's necessarily much to them, but you have a lot to say to us, and every word of scripture is breathed and inspired by you. And so speak to our hearts today in your name, amen. All right, starting in verse 4, 15. By the way, there are Bibles in the seats in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you can use those. If you don't have a Bible at home or your Bible's broken... Take one of those, take it home. It's our gift to you. You owe us nothing. We want you to have it. We want you to have the word of God in your house. It will also be up here. You can also use your phone if you want, but don't pull out your phone so that you can play Angry Birds or whatever. Is that still a thing? Do people still do that? Okay. Don't, don't do that. I know when you're doing it. When you keep going like this, I don't think you're reading the scripture, okay? All right. Here we go. For whatever things were written before... Now remember, this is coming out of all this stuff about scruples and about how we treat our brothers and so on. And he says, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What's he talking about the things that were written before? Well, of course, he's talking about the scripture. 
right? The things that were written before in the scripture were written for our learning. It does you no good to read the Bible and not learn from it. It doesn't do anything for you, okay? Now, I'm still going to say do it because hopefully you'll learn something and you want to get it in your heart because his word won't return void. But the point of the scriptures is for our learning. And our learning for what? It says it right here. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. What do, we, what do we have here? What is this scripture that we have? It is the revealed word of God. And so as we read it, what it does is it, it shows us all of these things that were prophesied from before, that have come true, that have been revealed in this time, and that we, that we understand. And what it does is it gives us a couple things, patience and comfort. And those things, what are they, what are they about? Our hope. Your hope, Christ for. If you're a Christ for, here's your hope. Not that you will have a perfect life. You will not necessarily, you might, but you won't necessarily have a healthy life. You will not necessarily have a wealthy life. I, uh, the Lord promises you none of that. What he promises you is everlasting life, eternal life. Most of which, and when I say most of, that's like an LOL. So much, this is nothing, this life we're living right now. You live 100 years and the people in heaven are like, that's, not, that's a whisper, it's nothing. It doesn't even exist on the scale of eternity. It's not even a thing. You will live forever, and that time will be spent with no crying, no tears, no pain, no suffering, no sin, and the, and the incredible love directly to you. Then we shall see face to face the love of Jesus Christ. That's your hope. And so how do we wait for that hope? With patience, and while we're waiting, comfort. And where do we get those things? From the scripture. How do we get patience? Well, we watch what all the other saints have done. From the very beginning... All the way through the scriptures, we see what people endured and that they were able to endure. As Paul said, I finished the race, right? He endured an awful lot. You probably won't endure as much as Paul. Maybe you will. I doubt it. But, if you, but you know that you can because through the power of the Holy Spirit, he did. Now, that gives me has some patience in those difficult times. It also gives me comfort because the promises of God are sure and irrevocable. They cannot be taken away. And so we know that God works all things together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. I can just put that, boom, there it is, comfort. Comfort and patience. Patience and comfort in the scripture. I mean, this is an incredibly important verse, the patience and comfort of the scriptures that we might have hope. Well, that tells you something. You should be listening. There's a reason we study the Bible. There's a reason we've been in Romans for, I don't know how long, a couple years, maybe a year and a half. I don't know how long we've been in Romans, but a long time. We spent a few years in Acts, right? We do it because I want you to know the word of God, because God wants you to know the word of God, because in the word of God, you find that patience and that comfort and that hope, and you don't find it anywhere else. And so learn from it. It was written for your learning that you might have those things. That's a great endorsement of the Bible. Now, may the God of patience and comfort, see those words again, where does patience and comfort come from? From God. Can you get patience and comfort anywhere else? You cannot. If you look in the world, you will see very little patient and very little with this guy. There will be comfortable. There's some nice chairs out there, pretty comfortable, right? But comfort, the thing that gives you peace, where you feel comfort, the idea of a perfect father. None of our fathers were perfect, and none of you who are fathers are perfect. But we can, we can imagine the perfect father and being in his arms being comforted. That's what we have. And who does that? Well, he's the God of patience and comfort. Now, may he grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the God of patience and comfort is telling you something. He's saying, listen, you all need to be like-minded. Like-minded, right? We, we talk about being in one accord, that's not the Honda, that, that has to do with us being together, right? Moving together in the same direction with the same purpose, one mind, right? Not one mind like we all think the same thing, like the Borg in Star Trek, nerd. Yes, I've, I've seen Star Trek, the next generation, and the Borg, they're kind of like this hive mind. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, like when we think about one accord, we think about a chord, like when we play on the guitar, we have multiple notes that make up a chord, that make up one sound that's, that's doing one thing. 
we're all playing different notes at some level because the body of Christ it has a bunch of unique parts. But we're all moving in the same direction. We're of one mind. Why? Because the God of patience and comfort has used that to give us patience and comfort as we walk forward. And what causes a lack of patience and comfort? Disunity. So Paul's sitting here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and saying, hey, look, have patience and comfort, the God of patience and comfort. And one of the ways for that, have like-mindedness toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. That's how we're supposed to be, that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to, as this, as a church, okay, as this local expression of the body of church, this is what we're responsible for, you and me. Not just me, not just the other pastors, not just the staff, not just the elders, not just the deacons, not just ministry leaders, all of us, every single one of you that's called to this church, we are all called to, with one mind and one mouth, glorify God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so how do we do that? When we're all of one mind and we're all on the same page and we're moving forward, the people out there, those that are lost, those that the Lord is calling to himself, will see when we speak with one mind and they will also see when we don't. So if there's division and disunity, people see that. In fact, they're very fast to point out the amount of disunity that exists within the church. And the only witness that we can have is to say, not this church, not Acts Church, not the church that we've been called to. It's not going to be disunified so that we speak with one voice and we have one mind glorifying God. Now, this is important for them, right? As I just told you and reminded you, you have Jew and Gentile trying to make this thing happen together. The Jews with the thousands of years of history of what it means to be a Jew and the Gentiles who came along lately found out Jesus rose from the dead and got saved. And the Jews are like, well, you know, we have this whole thing. And the Gentiles are like, I don't know about that. I'm just excited for the grace of Jesus Christ. And so there's this, this thing going on. So it says, therefore, this is verse seven, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So what, what needs to happen there? Gentile needs to receive Jew. Jew needs to receive Gentile. These are both Christians. We're not talking about non-Christian Jews here. We're talking about the church. Okay, Jew needs to receive, Gen- Jewish Christian needs to receive Gentile Christian. Gentile Christian needs to receive Jewish Christian. In the same way, you, all from different places and different uh, walks of life and different cultural backgrounds and different whatever, the Northwest, like, like the United States in general, is a hodgepodge of folks, Right? Out of many, one, e pluribus unum, this whole idea is we've got lots of folks, lots of different ideas, lots of different stuff. You've got to accept one another. You've got to receive one another as Christ also received you, received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. So this first part is going to be an and here, okay? You can circle the and if you want because it's important. He says, Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. The circumcision are the Jewish people, okay? For the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. The promises made to the fathers about their salvation. That one would come, that a Messiah would come, that the Christ would come, there would be salvation. Jesus came and confirmed it. How? Because he lived a sinless life. He showed the power of God in miracles and casting out demons and healing people. Right? The blind saw, the leper was healed, and then he died, and then he rose again. That was a confirmation to the circumcision, the Jews, that the promises made to the fathers in the Old Testament are true. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So, he, so once again, we see this just over and over and over in the book of Romans. Jews, yep, it's, this, is, this is definitely about you. The fathers, the promises, Abraham, and so on. And for the Gentiles, who are also children of Abraham because they're children of the faith that he had, which was a thing that was important. It wasn't his genetics that were important in this case for salvation. It was his faith that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. That faith is what we are children of, whether we're physically descended from Abraham or not. And so he says, and the gen- that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Now he's going to go into the Old Testament and show, just in case we still have some in the back in the church of Rome, Jewish Christians who aren't getting it yet, he's going to show it to them through the Old Testament. And here's a few verses. For this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing your name. 
And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, which is what Paul's asking these folks to do right here. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, that's Jesus, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. So what he's saying is, look, there, the, this has been prophesied from the beginning. The fact that you have looked at the Gentiles as evil, just remember, Jewish people wouldn't even touch. They did, like, physically did not want to touch a non-Jewish person. That's how much they disliked Gentiles. They certainly weren't eating with them. As, of course, the Gentiles weren't kosher. They weren't following the dietary lies. I mean, it was just separate. And they were called to be a separate people, but not to, not to hate the Gentiles, which is sort of what it seems like happened. And here we have Jew and Gentiles trying to make this thing happen together, and, and the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to say, well, all you need to do is look at the Old Testament. See, this was always the plan. It was always the plan that Jew and Gentile would be together. This is verse 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. So earlier, we remember just over here, it said, for whatever things were written before, written for our learning, that we might, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, that we might have hope, right? And then he says, he's the God of, of patience and comfort. And then here, on the, on the next part, he says, now may the God of hope. So he is the God of patience, of comfort, and of hope. May he fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, Paul is coming back to this theme. May God give you hope, joy, and peace. Now, why is this important? Because to be a Christ follower is to live a life of hope and joy and peace and patience and comfort. If you go and you read the fruits of the Spirit, what you're going to find is these things, love, joy, peace, right? Gentleness, self-control, all these things. These are the mark that the Holy Spirit is in you and that you are so into the Spirit and not to the flesh, as he talks about in chapter 6 and 7 going into chapter 8, is that, is that war between the, the flesh and the Spirit. If you're so into the Spirit, you're going to have the fruits of the Spirit because they're the fruits of God. Who's the God of comfort? Who's the God of peace? Who's the God of hope? Who's the God of joy? Who's the God of love? All of these things. And so he's saying, don't forget that. Live like that. Not in disunity. The church is with one mind, all of you, seeking after, desiring to emulate, to be like God in this, that you have hope, that you have peace, that you have comfort. If you're a person, and most of us are from time to time, but many people are now, including some believers, who is not living a life of peace, comfort, hope, then you're missing out on your birthright as a Christ follower. And that's why Paul is, is being inspired by the Holy Spirit here to, rem, to remind and remind and remind about peace and patience and comfort and hope and joy. Because these are the things that mark the life of a believer. And if that's not what your life is feeling like, get into the scriptures. Why? Because the first thing that we read this morning, because they were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. And what does hope give you? It gives you joy. It gives you peace. It gives you patience. It gives you comfort. All of those things. These things are like, they build on each other. They snowball on each other. The more hope that I have, the more that I'm hoping in faith for eternal life, that I'm going to be with Jesus, that I, can, that I can right now, right here today, that I can live how he wants me to live, the more that's going to create in me peace, the more that's going to create in me joy and patience, right? And that's going to create more hope, which is going to create, and it's just going to keep going. Verse 14, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. All right, so there's a few things there. You're full of goodness. Well, I know that you are, if you're a Christ follower, full of goodness. Why? Because you're full of the Holy Spirit. Because you have Christ, so I know you're full of goodness. Now, whether you're living in that and walking in that, well, if you're not, then confess your sins and repent. And the Bible tells us, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then you're back to living full of goodness. Full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. 
Now, how do we get knowledge? Well, the scripture tells us, Jesus tells us in the book of John that the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, as you'd find in the, in the Greek, will give you knowledge. That's what he'll do. He'll teach you. If you're reading the scripture, if you're learning from the things that were written, you will have knowledge. And so as a Christ follower, you can be filled with all knowledge. And he's saying, hey, you guys are. You Romans are. Able also to admonish one another. And that's an interesting thing because what he's saying is because you have this goodness and this knowledge, because of those things, you're able to admonish one another. Now, admonish is just what it sounds like. Sometimes you've got to tell each other what's up. Sometimes you're in sin, and your brother or sister needs to be able to tell you that. Now, what are the prerequisites to your brother or sister telling you that? Get right with the Lord so you're filled with all goodness. Know the scriptures so you're filled with all knowledge, and then get to the admonishing. I would admonish without those two things, just so we're clear. If you're sitting here living in this very, very sinful life, and you're not, you don't know the scripture, you don't put any time into knowing the scripture, then who are you to come in and help your brother? You, you don't know what you're doing. It's the, it's the thing that Christ talks about when he says, you've got, you got a plank in your eye trying to get the speck out of their eye. No, first remove the plank, then you can see clearly to get the speck. Same idea here. If you're filled with all goodness, all knowledge, knowing the scripture, then you're able to admonish. And admonishing is important, as we talked about weeks ago in our study on church discipline, which you can go back to YouTube or the website and watch. Okay, where are we at? Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points, as reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. So he's telling, he's talking to them again, both Jew and Gentile, and he's saying, listen, the grace, I've written to you boldly because that God has given me grace to be a minister to the Gentiles. This is important because Paul, of course, as, as, for those of you who know, we've talked about Paul before, Paul was the Israelite of Israelites, circumcised on the eighth day, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, learning the Pharisee of Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin, as to the law perfect, and so on. These are all things that he can tell you about himself. So as to the Jewish people, he had a resume as a Jewish person that was very strong prior to the Lord saying, all of that's rubbish. You're saved by grace, right? Grace through faith and changing his life. But as to them, he can speak as to the scriptures with knowledge because they know that he was incredible. Paul may have been the most educated man. I would say he was the most educated man in the ancient world and probably the most educated man ever because of the personal teaching that he received from Christ. Okay, there, we're talking about years of personal teaching he got from Christ. So Paul was probably the most educated man ever. And now when he wants to speak to his Jewish brethren and say, listen, I'm the, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. Hey, this is good that the grace of God should go to the Gentiles, this is a good thing. That, that sort of, I think, sort of seals it up. To make the Gentiles obedient, he uses that, that word. He says, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So, what he's saying is, well, let me finish it. And, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. So what he's saying is, listen, I, what I've been doing, my call, has been to go around to places where no one's heard of Jesus, essentially, and to evangelize and bring the gospel to those people, to make the Gentiles obedient. Now, this is, that kind of word is good for the Jewish hearers of this because they want the Gentiles to be obedient. They don't like the idea, nor should they, of cheap grace. They, they spent all this time thinking they had to earn it because that's what the Pharisees had taught them. They have the law from the scripture. You know, you got the first five books of the Bible. And then you've got the Talmud, which has got all the rules about the rules about the rules about the rules. And you do all this stuff, and that's how you become good. And that's what's been in their mind. That's how they were brought up. So they come in, and it's like, no, it's 100% by grace through faith. You do not get in by anything that you do. Well, that old habits die hard. And so they're struggling with that 
as these Gentiles come in, having done none of these things, having not lived that life at all, having not earned anything, and they're saved. And of course, Paul's got to tell them, you didn't earn anything either. None of that earns you anything. They got to deal with that. So when he comes back, he says, I'm making the Gentiles obedient. At least there, it's like, but there is an obedience. When we come to Christ, there is something that we're called to do. There is a way that we're called to live. And I'm teaching them that. They, the Jews would have already known it. They knew the law. They knew it was right and wrong. So they knew that coming to Christ, they still had to do what was right, even if the ceremonial side of the law no longer applied. They understood morality. The Gentiles, however, had been living in pagan madness. And so when Paul says, no, I'm, gonna, I'm teaching them how to be obedient also, I think that probably helps the Jews who are there to feel more comfortable about it. What does the Great Commission say? Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age of, even to the end of the age, amen. That's what Christ says. Teach them the obedience. So Paul says, that's what I'm doing, right? And he said, I'm going to places where nobody else has preached so that I can, so that the Lord can do this work. And he's telling them that because Paul didn't start this church. He's writing to this church, but he didn't start this church. And now he's going to go into a thing he's going to talk about here in a bit, how he wants to come and visit them. But he knows that he didn't build that church, or that Christ didn't build that church through him. So he's letting them know that, hey, I went to all these other places and did it. That's my resume. For this reason, I also have been much hindered in coming to you. The reason I haven't come to you, I've wanted to come to you. I love you guys. I want to be there in Rome. But the reason I haven't come to you is because God's called me to go to all these places, hither and yon, as they'd say, to preach the gospel and start churches. But I want to come to you too. So... But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. Now, I want you to notice the word hope there, for I hope to see you. In other words, Paul doesn't know that he's going to see them. He doesn't know that he's going to make it to Spain. And in fact, when he does actually see the church in Rome, it's in chains, it's in chains. He doesn't get to go there as he's traveling to Spain to, to do more missionary work. Instead, he goes there not by, his, not by his own volition, but he's taken there in chains. And so it says, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Now, of course, as he goes to Jerusalem, that's where he is put in chains. Paul continues to go to Jerusalem. As if you recall from the book of Acts, he's, he's told, it's prophesied, hey, they're going to they're gonna put you in chains. They're going to put you in chains. Agabus, the prophet, takes his belt and ties himself up and says, the, the one whose belt this is, this is what's going to happen. You're going to, get, you're going to get tied. You're going to be put in chains. And Paul's like, I don't care. I'll die if I have to die. I'm going to Jerusalem. That's what I'm called to do. And he knew it from the time that he wrote Romans. He knew that's where he was going. His face was set. He was going. And of course, he ends up in chains and then does get back to Rome after he appeals to Caesar. He ends up back in Rome. Read the book of Acts. Good stuff. Um, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia, these are areas of Greece, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So the, the Christians in Jerusalem, there had been a famine, there had been all kinds of stuff. Paul goes out and he's collecting money for them to help them out. And so he's collecting from these churches, these Gentile churches, to bring money to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. If it pleased them, and indeed... It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Once again, you see how he's, how he's helping them become one mind and one people. As he's gone through this whole thing that equalized Jew and Gentile, which was hard for the Jews, he brings back, in, and, because he always says to the Jew first and then the Gentile, right? To the Jew first and then the Gentile. Because the spiritual heritage comes from the Jew. Why? Because the, the, the seed of David, the seed of Abraham, the God's chosen people, was, of course, Jesus Christ, who was Jewish. And all of this came because God had separated and set apart his people in perfection that, that Jesus could come through them and save us. So as Gentiles, if you're not a Jewish person, you have a debt, as Paul says here, to those through whom our faith was brought to us. And so that's what he's saying. So you know what? Since, they, since they're experiencing the blessings, the spiritual blessings that came from the church, these Christians, the first Christians were all Jews. The disciples were all Jews. The first Christians were all Jews. At Pentecost, you have 3,000 getting saved. You have the church in Jerusalem growing. Those are all Jews. 
They're all Jewish Christians, and they're the ones who go out, the diaspora from Jerusalem, as Paul and his friends were coming to cause a lot of trouble before he was saved. They go everywhere, including Rome, right? These are all Jews. And so all the Gentiles owe the Jews a debt. And one of the ways that they showed their gratitude was to raise money for people they didn't know all the way in Jerusalem who were Jewish Christians. And Paul's telling the people in Rome so that the Jews in Rome, as well as the Gentiles, understand that. And it helps, once again, what? To create like-mindedness, which he's been calling for. And really, this entire book of Romans, one of the, one of the things that flows from the front to the back of it is to create like-mindedness between Jewish Christian and Gentile Christian. All right. Uh, therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed, them, sealed to them this fruit, bringing the money to them, I shall go by way of you to Spain. He's hoping, not the way that, that it happened, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And of course, however he comes, he's going to do that, because wherever he goes, he comes in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ, because he's a preacher of the gospel of Christ all the time. If you read through the book of Acts, you see that Paul, anytime, if there's a microphone, Paul's grabbing it to preach the gospel. If he has an opportunity, he's preaching the gospel. Actually, when he goes to Jerusalem and, the, and they're, they're coming after him, the Romans have to come save him because the Jews are going to tear him apart. And they get him and they get him to, the, to basically the jail. And he's standing there. He says, let me talk to him real quick. They're like, kill him. I'm kill him. He's like, let me talk to him real quick. And he tries to preach the gospel. It does not work. They're, they're not having it. But he's always, he, just, he has this desire. He must preach the gospel. And so, of course, he's going to come to them in the fullness, Right? All right. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. He knows that he needs prayer. Paul recognizes the value of prayer. And you could just kind of let this verse go by. Oh, he's asking to pray for him. Why is he asking to pray for him? Because he knows the Lord well enough to know that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. And that the prayers of the church at Rome will help him. And in fact, he could have died in Jerusalem. He could have died with, when he was with Felix and so on in the next He could have died in the shipwreck. He could have died. But they actually prayed for him. He actually made it back to Rome and, and was able to witness in Rome, including the people of Caesar's household. And by the way, eventually, Rome became Christian. And Paul's Paul, the Lord using Paul to get there, was part of that, but he asked for their prayers. So when you ask somebody to pray for you, it's not a throwaway. Will you pray for me? As if it has no power. God listens to his children. Your prayers are powerful. Even small ones, even short ones, all day long. If you wake up and can just be in prayer, just be in prayer. And of course, I'll take all the prayers that you have for me. And if you need prayers for you, that's all we have on the app, the, the prayer uh, section there where you can go and say, I need prayer. And you just let people know, hey, I'm praying for you. Or you put the little prayer hands, which I think is actually a high five, but we use it for prayer hands. And that's what it looks like to me is prayer hands. So we do that because it's powerful. This is not a throwaway verse here. Paul's asking them to pray for him because he wants them to pray for him because he believes that their prayers avail much. And so we need to make sure that we are praying. that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Well, he was not delivered from them, except that he was. He was and he wasn't. He got arrested by the Romans. He was delivered from death because they were going to kill him, those who did not believe the Jewish uh, non-Christians in Jerusalem. That I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So we, we have here sort of the end, the end of verse 15, sort of the end of, of this part of what's going on, right? We have all this, we have this introduction, and then we start kind of at verse 18 of chapter 1, just start going through this theological, uh, amazingly dense theological explanation. And then we get to 12, like I said, and we start getting through the practical. And then here at the end of 15, we sort of end that section of it, and he's going to start uh, the end of the letter, okay, the last part, the farewell part of the letter, and that's going to be chapter 16, and there's some stuff that's in here that's still instructive, but some of it I want us to see some other things about, so let's start at the beginning of chapter 16, it says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who was a servant of the church in Centuria, 
that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Here's one of the things I love about what Paul does here. He starts with a woman. He's going to start talking about the people. He's going to talk about a lot of people, but he starts with a woman. Why? Well, because remember, you remember in Acts when it says these men, these are, these are the people, the Christians, who have turned the world upside down and now they've come here too. This is part of turning the world upside down. When he says, I want you to greet my sister Phoebe, who is incredibly helpful, and I want you to help her in whatever she needs. And that's where I'm starting. He doesn't start with a dude. He starts with a woman. What does that, what does that do? It just it sets the stage. As Christ followers, we make no distinction in value between men and women. In fact, here's my sister Phoebe, who has been extremely helpful in the ministry. I'm not only going to honor her. Her name's in the Bible forever. It's the first one listed in this section. And he's telling the church, you help her. You do what she, when she asks something of you, you do it. That's an incredibly important thing. It actually took the Western world uh, hundreds, thousands of years to actually just catch up to where Paul already was in terms of feminism. Now, when I use that word, I mean the value of women being equal to the value of men. It took thousands of years for the West to catch up with what's clearly here in the Scripture. And this is not the only place where it is. Because Christianity turned the world upside down, the world took a while to actually catch on. So, help Phoebe out. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now, this is an interesting one, too, because he names Priscilla first. Normally speaking, you would name the husband and then the wife, but he names Priscilla and then Aquila. I I think that it's intentional that it's done that way because everything in the Bible is intentional. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the churches in their house. I believe that Priscilla and Aquila were originally from Rome, probably left when the Jews left and then came back. That's my guess, but Priscilla and Aquila are the ones who, for instance, when Apollos, who was a big preacher back in the first century, this really, was really good preacher, um, didn't fully understand the, the gospel, right? He, he understood the Old Testament, he understood Jesus, but he didn't really understand the gospel. These, these guys are the ones that taught him. Priscilla and Aquila sat there and discipled Apollos that he could understand more clearly the way of God. You can read about Priscilla and Aquila in Acts. They're, they're, they're helping out with, with Paul. I think they might be tent makers also. I can't remember. I don't remember everything. But I believe that's how, um, uh, how they all work together. But these guys, they risk their lives. This woman and this man risk their lives for Paul. He wants them to know that. And he wants them to be honored. Greet my beloved Apinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Now he's saying, hey, in this region, this was the first dude that got saved. That's a, that's a pretty cool distinction. You're, you're in your entire region, there's no believers, and you're the first one to get saved. It's pretty cool. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So he's saying, look, these are believers, longtime believers. They're his countrymen. And fellow prisoners, they were in prison with them. And they're of note, amongst the apostles, these people are of note, who are also in Christ's form. So it sounds like these are Jewish Christians. Once again, there's this, there's some Gentiles, there's some Jews, it's all the same. He's, he's bringing that around, but he's saying, let's honor these people. And, and we're going to get through this, but then I want to say something about this whole section. Greet Amplius, my beloved, in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved, Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and, all, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus, Philologus and Julia, Julia. Nereus and his sister Olympus and all the saints who are with him greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now, I want to say something about this whole section that I think is extremely important because it tells us something about Paul. It tells us something about a Christ follower and what their life should look like. In a quick breath, he's just named, I, don't, I didn't count how many people there are there, a bunch, who he calls beloved, who have helped him. What, what do we know about Paul from this? He has a lot of real 
serious, deep relationships. And where, where are they all stemming from? They're all stemming from work done in the church. These are people helping in the ministry, and in doing so, Paul is, is, is gaining these very serious, lifelong, you know, important friendships. He and Priscilla and Aquila, they've spent time together. They've built a, a, a relationship together, and it's real, and it's significant, and it's serious. And in that, they've helped one another. They've risked their lives together. All these people, all this help, all the, they're beloved. I love these people. Now, how many people could rattle off a list like this of people who they're that close to, who they can put their stamp on, who they can say, yep, greet this one, do this for this one. Not many of us have that many significant relationships. We've drifted from that quite a bit as we've, as we've lived more of our lives on these things, Right? And it's all the text and it's all the Facebook and it's all the whatever. I sound like an old man. All the text and the Facebooks and the ticker talks and the... Anyway, all that stuff, right? We're, we're doing all that and what's, what's missing is sitting there making a tent with Aquila and Priscilla and just enjoying fellowship, talking about the Lord, talk, making jokes, doing whatever they did, right? Building a life of friendships together. This is what's happening. I think that one of the reasons we see all this, obviously he, it's got a practical reason. He was really telling the church in Rome, greet these people when they show up. Or if they're there already in Rome, you know, make sure that you're, that you're paying attention to these folks because I know them and I love them. They're connected to me. So it's practical for that reason. But for us, obviously these people aren't coming. These people are all in the Lord. They're, they're in heaven with the Lord. Ask for the body, present with the Lord. So that's not what's for us. What's for us? To recognize the significance of how many relationships he had with these people and that they had with him because day after day, month after month, year after year, they served the Lord together. And there is nothing that builds a relationship stronger than that. If you're, if you're a husband or a wife, you want to be close, serve the Lord together. Make your life about serving the Lord together. Have your thoughts be about how are we serving the Lord together? Are we volunteering together in the body of Christ? Are we going to, to Honduras on a mission trip together? Are we, what are we doing? Are we, are we thinking about our finances to serve the Lord? Is our life built that together as partners we're serving the Lord? Because if you want to be close and be loved, there's nothing that will draw people together and have them put aside their differences and so on as much as serving the Lord. And so all these people are serving the Lord with Paul, and he's just naming them off, this one and this one, and Andronicus and Aristobulus and Herodian and whatever, all these people, because he knows them, he loves them. They're close to him. And I think very few Christ followers today can make a list like that. But we should be able to. That is who we should be. And so we need to think about how much of this little rectangle we're connected to. Not that they're not great things these things can do, I talked about angry birds already, right? But they don't build relationships. All right, we're getting there. This one's important. Avoid divisive or divisive persons. That's the section heading here. That's not part of the Bible. They just put that in there so that we would know what we're going to read next. Now, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. Now, what's the doctrine they learned? Well, all the stuff that he just taught. So if you want a, a Christian theology in as, in as compact of a spot to get a very deep theology that you can get, the book of Romans is it. He has laid out for these folks an awful lot of Christian theology. Not everything. Obviously, we have the whole scripture. But an awful lot of it. They've been taught this. They also would have the letters that were going to the other churches and so on. These things, were, these things were passing around because they were considered to be scripture. And he says, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. So that, what does that mean? We actually have to pay attention to those who twist the scripture earlier talked about admonishing them. We talk, he talked about unity. Part of unity is getting rid of those who are divisive. We can't have those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned. You got to avoid them. That means sometimes, we talked about the church discipline, sometimes you remove people because they refuse to 
to teach and to believe sound doctrine, sound teaching, what the scripture says. And he's very serious about that. Get them out. Because you can't be, earlier we just saw, one mind, one mouth, glorifying the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do that if there's people causing divisions and offenses within the church? And this is a warning also. Jew and Gentile are in this church. They both got their ideas. There have probably been all kinds of divisions that have gone on. And he's saying, if that's going to keep going, you mark that person, you avoid them. Don't let them do it. This is what he says. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus. Now, this is a very important thing for you to think about. If you find yourself becoming contentious, divisive, offensive, if that's you, you need to think about the fact that you may be one of these people, and in that, in that thing, you do not serve our Lord Jesus. Not serve Jesus Christ, but what? Their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. They serve the flesh. Those who would twist doctrine, who would twist the scripture, they serve the flesh. Their own belly. And why do they do it? Lead people astray. Gain a following. Gain power within the world. They've got smooth words. They've got flattering speech. What does it say? In the end times, what's going to happen? They're going to bring people around who will tell their itching ears what they want to hear. You're great. You're powerful. You've got a breakthrough coming, brother and sister. Sow a seed, little dollar seed, maybe a thousand dollars. Good things are going to come your way. That's wrong. It's evil. That serves the Lord not at all. What does it serve? Their belly. Rich televangelist driving around a Rolls Royce. Oh, the faith of these people. Yeah, the poor people that you just fleeced for money. With your smooth words, you're flattering. You're telling them everything's going to go so a seed and you're going to get rich. That's satanic. That's evil. I'm not saying everyone who does it is satanic. Just don't, don't write me emails, okay? What I'm saying is to, to promise people that they can buy the kingdom in that way, that they can buy goodness that way. Look, we give because the Lord's called us to give because everything is his. Not because he's going to give us money. But that's what these people say. Smooth words and flattery. Now we have a whole other set of it. Those who tell everyone they're going to heaven. The progressive Christian. You don't need, yeah, don't judge. You don't really need Jesus' death. His resurrection is just a symbol of victoriousness and whatever. And maybe it was just a spiritual resurrection. Maybe it didn't really happen. And maybe I'm not a Christian at all, which is what they're not. But by smooth words and flattery, what, what's the flattery? Do what you want to do. I'm not going to admonish you. Do what you want to do. Not only, not only do what you want to do. I will wear the uniform of people who are doing things that the Bible calls perverse and wrong and things that will harm them instead of, instead of loving them and saying, look, come out of that and come into Christ and let him heal you. They're saying, do it. Do it. Not only, not only do I celebrate it. And God would celebrate it. Evil. Satanic. It's wrong. And we try, we try to go, well, these are our Christian brothers and sisters. Let me just tell you something. No, they're not. I said it. They are not acting as Christians. They may be saved. I have no idea whether these people are saved and just deceived. But I can tell you this. They do not. Those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. There are those who want to live in a way that dishonors God. And there are those who have become happy to preach it to them for their own, so they can build their own church, their own following, so they can do whatever they want to do, so that they can be kind or, no, nice. They want to be nice. I just want you to understand something. You are living in an age where people are twisting the scriptures where people are becoming divisive and offensive over issues that the scripture could not be more clear on. We're talking stuff that's from Genesis 2 that they're getting wrong, okay? That goes throughout the whole scripture. Things like a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, that he shall become one flesh. And we go, no, don't have to do any of that. Sleep with who you want. 
You don't need to be married to them. Or get married to people that are of your own gender. Not man, man shall leave his father and mother to be joined to his husband. Doesn't happen. Not a thing. Marriage is created by God. And I know these are hot button issues and blah, 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 blah. But we've got churches. Churches. People putting on a, a, a frock and a rainbow flag scarf and blessing evil. And telling people, people who need Jesus and who need church and who need to be admonished and need to be loved and brought to the Lord with truth, telling them, do what you want to do. Go destroy yourself. Go destroy yourself. What I say is, please, I love you. Please stop. I want you to have peace. I know you think that's the only way you can have it. And Christ has said, it's not. Obey him, trust him, and he will work all things for good for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. But if you will not do what he commands, you do not love him. And yes, these people are not serving the Lord Jesus Christ when they do that. And I know that even within the Christian community where people, for some reason, we get very shy when a pastor starts to go this other direction. We go, well, we just agree to disagree. I grew up in, uh, I know we're getting past time, I don't care. I do care about you and your time, but I care about the Word of God, and I want to get through Romans. So um, I grew up in the Quaker church, the Friends Church, and uh, there were lots of great things about the Friends Church, and there were some not so great things about the Friends Church. One of the things that was not so great is that they were, they had no Christian word, courage. Um, There was nothing, you know, they had no courage. They They had no backbone. And so what would happen is somebody would get upset loud enough or whatever. I'm talking about the denomination. I'm just going to talk about it in the Northwest. I'm not going to talk about it in other parts of the country. But they had no backbone. They let people kind of move things this way or move things that way. And when I was younger, it wasn't on really big issues. It was more on like kind of they did some weird stuff. But as we moved forward in time, they allowed a progressive element in their churches and they did not go in and admonish, exhort, and rebuke. They allowed it to happen until several years back when about, I don't know if it was half, but a good portion of their churches divided from them over the issue of homosexuality and left. And now about half of those churches are, are, what do they call Affirming? Affirming sin is what it is. They're affirming, including Camus Friends Church in Camus, uh, what you what you I don't know if they still call it Reedwood Friends Church, West Hills Friends Church, uh, half of Newburgh Friends Church was a huge church. Anyway, some of you may know these places, but the bottom line is they left. And, they, and, and what I would have done, well, this never would have happened if I was there. I would have been busting butts from day one. But what I would have done when they said, hey, we'd like to divide, I'd be like, you are divided. You go. You aren't taking the churches you're not taking the properties. You're not taking the people. You go. You've been, you've been teaching doctrines of demons. You go, and we're going we're gonna to keep this denomination Christian because we're a Christian denomination. But they didn't do that. And they let it happen and happen and happen until they said, let's just all be friends. I'm not friends with that. I need you to understand that. I am not friends with someone who calls themselves a pastor and preaches evil. And it is evil to tell people that things that will harm them and kill them are good and life-giving to them. To call evil good and good evil is an abomination to me. We don't do it. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But we, we do know what being perfect is so that we can be humble and repent and come, to the, to come back to the Lord on things we're not. We don't start saying, you know what? Forget this. I'll tell you what's good. Whatever you want to do, so long as you show up and we sing kumbaya, It's not Christianity. It's the primrose path to hell. And people who come in to, it, to, to know a Jesus who has no standards do not know Jesus. And so I'll preach to you the way, the truth, and the life who says, no, if you love me, you'll do what I command. And then we'll, and then we'll work to do it. <laughs> All failing, but we have the opportunity to be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9. You always have that. So we come back, but I'm not going to tell you you don't need to confess and repent because it's not sin. And here's what Paul's saying. Avoid those people. Get them out. 
Do not pretend like churches who do that are churches or pastors who do that are pastors. Start having some backbone if you're a Christ follower and say, that's not a church and you're not a pastor. Because that's what the scripture says. Avoid them. They serve their own belly. And some of you go, no, 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 no. Their whole point is that they just want to be kind. They want to be nice. It's really, it's really their own kindness. It's their own empathy that's dr- driven them in this direction. Empathy, when, when, I, when I meet somebody who struggles with alcoholism, I have a lot of empathy for what they're going through. I never think to myself, one of the good solutions that would show empathy is to say, keep drinking. It's absurd. And yet they go, well, this is what my empathy looks like. Keep doing it. Do more. Not only do it, not only do it, I'll run the drinking party. I'll come, come to the church. We'll celebrate you getting drunk and, and destroying your family. No, we go, hey, come to the waters of life. Let the burden off your back at the cross be forgiven, be set free. Not keep doing it. And that's what the people back then did to cause division, and that's what people do now to cause division. Let's finish this up. Timothy, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish. See the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, because the Roman church was known for being an obedient church at this time. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Be wise in what is good and don't, don't know anything about evil. Don't have anything to do with all of that. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And by the way, talk about a satanic place that Rome was. And that eventually it's where Christianity succeeded and began the West, which still infects the entire world to this day, is the name of Jesus Christ that came up and destroyed all that. Nobody talks about Mars and Jupiter and, and Roman gods as if they're real anymore. And everybody has to deal with the name of Jesus Christ. And that happened in the Roman Empire and even in the city of Rome. And so we did crush Satan under their feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay, real quick. Timothy, my fellow worker. Hopefully you guys know who Timothy is. And Lucius, Jason, Jason and Sosipater. If you're thinking about you're having a kid, think about a name, Sosipater. I think that would go over well. <laughs> my countrymen greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. So Paul had Tertius writing this out, um, being his recording this. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasure of the city, greets you. And Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So all these folks are here. Once again, these are all his buddies. These are all friends of his. These are all relationships. Now, to him, this is about Jesus. This is about God. To him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith to God alone, wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the book of Romans. And it's a good one. It's a really good one. And if you haven't been here for the whole study, go back and and, and get into it. Get into the word of God. New hobby for you. Get into the Word of God. I watched a TikTok or a something, one of those little reels the other day, of this girl who, she's like, three years ago, I would have laughed at you if you would have told me that I'm just in love with the Scripture. And she's just loving it. She's just like, I don't even want to go to work. I just want to sit here and be in the Bible. She goes to work. But she just wants to sit there and be in the Word all day long. She's just, she's just loving it. Get that affection for the Word because it's so good. It's so good. To God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And we want to live that way. If you do not know Jesus, you can be part of Christ's church. You can have the Holy Spirit. You can have hope and peace and joy and patience and comfort. This very book that that we've been reading, this letter to the Romans, Romans 10, 9 and 10, says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead, you will be saved. Right? For with the mouth confession is made unto righteousness, and with the heart one believes unto salvation. You, you can be saved. You can be saved. Be saved today. If, you're, if you've been living in sin, you've been ignoring your conscience, ignoring what God has put in his scripture today, confess that. Be done with it. I'm going to ask any elders that we have to go right out those two doors right there, and we're going to sing here. If the band wants to come on up, 
We're going to sing a song. And those of you who need prayer, please head out those doors right there and receive prayer, either for salvation. You want, to, you want to have somebody pray with you to help you confess and repent of sin. You've got something going on this week. You're going through a health issue. We've got folks going through cancer. We've got th- folks going through AFib. We've got folks going through all kinds of stuff. If you need prayer, go on out there and get prayer as we sing this song. This last song is called Man of Sorrows. And, and I'm asking that we would just take our love for Jesus Christ and our joy at finally finishing Romans and that we would sing to the Lord with a full heart as we worship him